Jesus takes us in his first public sermon. It's honest, it's true, it's raw, it's real. We're going to talk about adultery, marriage, sex, lust. Why are we going to talk about it? Jesus talked about it. One of the things that's true though, is if you come and you gather in here, you bring your kiddos, or perhaps you're at home, sitting at home on a couch, and you don't have the privilege of kids' ministry right now in the same way and facet, I do want to give you guys just a fair warning that to the best of my ability, we're going to righteously teach this, and I'm going to fight to keep it PG, representing kiddos in the room. My version of PG, though, might be your version of a PG-13. So parents at home in particular, you may have to explain some words, disciple your kids, or if this is your excuse to watch somebody else or do something else or go eat breakfast, whatever you want. But here's what you need to know. This topic matters so much. Whether if you were to ever come and identify with a sense, right, especially if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that lust has crippled, hurt, or hindered your relationship with God or others, whether you could easily say, oh yeah, of course, or you're like that person all the way over here that like borderline identifies as like asexual. Wherever you are, this is for you and it's for me. This past week, staff and I, we went on this retreat. We got away for a couple days to go pray through, hey God, how would you have us care for your people? What would you have them do? How could we get better at it? How could we excel still more? How can we raise up leaders to disciple your people to reach the lost? That's what we went and we did. On the way back, this spiritual retreat, so much time thinking, praying, connecting, talking about Jesus, his people, I'm driving back, and another pastor on staff, Jonathan Dennis, is with me in the car. We get back into town from the retreat, and I'm driving, kind of, we're leaving McKenna, I cut through downtown, and the way to get to his house and then to mine, I kind of cut through Landa Park, if you know that route. As I'm driving down that road, just coming off this retreat, all this time, 60 yards in front of me to my left, there's a young female jogging, yoga pants, sports bra. She's far enough away I can't fully tell. I immediately look, see, and I immediately realize I want to keep looking. For the next five to six seconds, not a long time, I have to wait to turn. I'm driving down a road, if you know the street, and I have to turn right to get to Lando. Worst Fest is right there on my right. For the next five to six seconds, there is a willful choice in me. Don't look. I love my wife. I think my wife is absolutely beautiful. I think my wife knows that I feel that way about her. And for five to six seconds, there is a willful choice. Don't look. Don't look. It was um, interesting. I won't say funny. It was interesting. I asked Jonathan Dennis, the other pastor with me in the car, even this morning, I said, hey man, when when we were there, do you remember? He said, oh yeah. Before I even finished, he said she was down on the left. He had to turn and look at another sign too. Here's the reason I start with that. In that moment, there is a choice in me as a follower of Jesus Christ to intentionally look away, we'll we'll talk about it. It's to deny a lustful intent. Now, there's a lot of things there. Desire in and of itself, temptation, that's not inherently sin. We'll break that down too. But here's the reason I want to start with that. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I imagine you might be thinking, this guy's crazy. If you are just watching the narrative of culture today and examining the way we approach a sexual ethic, relationships with one another, standards, morality, whatever it might be, culture today would look at, hear about, and say things like, that guy's crazy. They'd probably use language like, oh man, that's so much form of repression. It's so broken. It's so wrong. You might have heard that. Or instead of coming and approaching things like lust with a sense of severity, putting it to death, which, by the way, is far worse than just repressing. Culture would come and say, moments like that don't hurt anyone, of course. Don't hurt anyone. But what is your sexual liberty for? What is your and my sexual freedom really really for? Culture would talk about it. It's like, no, no, no. Expressing yourself or, or looking at that, it's like an act of empowerment. 
you've seen this especially come out of using your body in a physical way towards sex as a form of empowerment. That would be the way culture talks about it today. That's why Jesus' standard, it's revolutionary. Culture would come and talk about intimacy or sex, that it would make it physical. It would make it transactional. It would come and it would tell you a lie and tell me a lie. And sadly, even if you don't believe in Jesus, you know this is a lie because you felt the cost of it. I say, no, 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 it's just a physical thing. It's just physical. It's transactional. There's no emotional connection. There's no spiritual connection. There's no, as a Hebrew Old Testament would talk about, the word dode, a commingling of souls. Where part of the reason you and I can so vividly remember even the history of your sexual sin, to whatever degree, as well as mine, the reason you can remember that is because it cuts way deeper than just physical. But that's what culture would tell you. It's what culture tells me. Culture would tell you, no, that moment, it's about your pleasure. Like, again, you're not hurting someone. So you take that moment and enjoy that, even if it's just looking or if it's going out or if it's getting on Tinder, right? And then going to a bar and having a couple drinks so you can socially feel good and then see where the night goes. You do yours. Have fun. Explore. You have to come. It's about feeling good. Culture would come and talk to you even about before marriage. It would give this broken sense of you have to make sure that you are sexually compatible. That's a lie. It's an absolute lie. But do you see me stopping? Or if you're a follower of Christ, you felt that moment. It does not matter if you are male or you are female. You have a lust issue just like me. And Jesus' standard it's revolutionary to that. You see, culture will come and, come and say, hey, pursuing what you want, it brings freedom. Here's what's true. Pursuing things outside the care of God, it's going to bring pain, shame, say it differently, death. I know it's such like a heavy moment, but really this is such a hopeful talk. The reason this is hopeful is in the midst of culture and life, wherever you are as regards to sexual sin, or if the fact I'm up here and I'm even talking about it, it makes you feel uncomfortable. Wherever you are, this is a liberating message from Jesus Christ where he's going to say, no, 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 no. Culture's telling you go that way. Go this way. It's better. Much of the fruit about the culture of the narrative around sex today. It can be traced back centuries, but we, particularly in America, we could trace that back 1960s, later 70s, the sexual revolution, summer of love, a time where culture came and it said, no, express yourself, normalize the sense of sex outside of marriage, sex without consequence. And that's just grown. What I want to share with you today is something totally countercultural something totally revolutionary. I want to talk about Jesus' revolutionary sexual ethic. And he's going to plead you and me to join a right, a true, a holy, a divine sexual revolution. What is normal in our culture today, tragically, even as followers of Christ, to go the way to where sexual sin marks us, cripples us. We, even in Christian marriages, we allow one spouse or another to almost tolerate and laugh at, and then we just try to turn a blind eye as we say, that's just the way she is. That's just the way he is. I'm so excited because this is a topic in my life, and I've had the privilege of talking with a lot of people, and with full humility, I've read a lot of God's book. It's a topic in your life that it brings a lot of pain. And Jesus Christ has a way out for you. He gives a way out for me. And that's what we're going to see. His revolutionary ethic is he bids you and me to join a righteous sexual revolution. And I do mean it that way. Like I'm talking opposite of the grain, going against the stream. And he's going to plead with us to swim. 
So we're going to be continuing our series in the book of Matthew. We're continuing in Jesus' first public sermon, Sermon on the Mount, where we are looking at this bid, this call from Jesus to join, as I'm going to say it, a new, a right, a true sexual revolution. Some of you, and we'll talk about this, even as I talk about sex in the context of church, it's sticky, it's cringy, it's God's design, it's his gift. We're going to try to redeem it. Because you and I, we have a tendency to misuse and break it. But as we talk about how to join the sexual revolution, the first thing we're going to see is God's revolutionary standard. Last week, if you were with us, we saw Jesus, he redefined some things. He redefined murder. He redefined murder by saying murder, it starts in the heart with anger. Today, he's going to redefine adultery. Or he's going to say, adultery, it starts in the heart, it's lust. We're going to look at God's revolutionary standard. The second thing we're going to talk about is God's revolutionary strategy. And at the end of this, what Jesus is building towards, especially in this section of Sermon on the Mount, here's the honest truth. You cannot meet his revolutionary standard. I'm giving you the conclusion before the beginning. You cannot meet his revolutionary standard. You cannot fully exercise, even though he's going to call you to still try, his revolutionary strategies. Cut off the hand, tear out the eye. You can't do it. Neither can I. So while he calls us to the revolution, here's the thing you need to know first and foremost. There's grace for the fact you and I can't make the cut. There's forgiveness for every ounce of the sexual sin in your life and in mine. He died on a cross. Part of what he's showing in this Sermon on the Mount is people think their external righteousness makes them good enough for God. And Jesus is saying, one, your external righteousness is not that good, but two, let's just investigate the heart. It's broken. It's sinful. You need help. And he's offering himself as savior. That is the first way you will join the true, right, glorious, righteous sexual revolution. And he wants you to. So grab your Bible. We're going to read Matthew 5, 27 through 28. All week long as I've prepared for this, this is not uh, helpful to the text in any way. I've had in the background of my head the song, and I'm sure none of you know it, but let's talk about sex baby let's talk about yeah i sang it i said it all right glad we can laugh a little bit it's okay jesus he starts and he's referencing old testament scripture right here right he's been teaching on things and then he's giving a greater interpretation of them before pharisees sadducees the religious elite of the day as well as a larger crowd gathering as he's teaching to his disciples he says 27 you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I'll read it again. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman, and we're going to talk about, or a man, with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her, insert, and him, in their heart heart. As Jesus is pleading with you and me as he's showing this sense of sin, the first thing he's teaching is God has a revolutionary standard. God has a revolutionary standard when it comes to your and my understanding of lust, adultery. You could say it differently, a Christian sexual ethic. What that means. Jesus is exposing our sinfulness by here he redefines adultery is lust. And this was completely countercultural for them as well as for today. I want to read to you a quote. This is by Dr. Tokumbo Adeyemo. I think I got that right. He's an African theologian. It's amazing what he wrote. He talked about this in context. He said, the general understanding, now this is a first century Jew. This is why it was revolutionary, countercultural, even then. The general understanding in Jewish society was that a woman needed to be chaste before marriage and faithful afterwards. That's a good thing. 
That's right. But now we're going to insert sin and double standard and hypocrisy. A man, however, was free to have sexual liaisons as long as he was discreet and did not involve a married woman, which would infringe the rights of another man. He goes on to say after this, making a comment about that first century culture, and he connects it to ours today. And he says, the people of Jesus' day were very modern in this manner. There's a few things that this doctor is pointing out as he approaches this text. He's saying first century Jewish culture, men would come, and there was discreet sexual sin amongst them, but as long as it wasn't flaunted, as long as it wasn't with another married woman, everyone looked the other way way. That's wrong on so many levels, and Jesus is addressing that. The fact that a female double standard, sinfulness in the man, the seventh commandment, the Ten Commandments, you know the big ten, you know what I'm talking about? Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, goes after adultery. Adultery, stepping outside of the confines of marriage in any form of sexual relations. The Old Testament, and you can go read this Leviticus 20, the Old Testament punishment for adultery was death. But this culture, these men had taken it, had watered it down, had twisted it, and had defined it to fit a lifestyle that was offensive to God in every single way. See, we come, and rightly, where we've taken the stance is there's now a greater sense of dignity, equality, and respect between male and female. But where our culture is going now in the way that this is still revolutionary today as it was then is we're still coming and saying, hey, hey, men, we used to dehumanize, we used to objectify, we used to use women. Your turn, females. Two wrongs will make it right. Dehumanize, objectify, use men. It's wrong. Jesus is saying this violates his law. And, and then you might think, and I read a scholar who said this, this just solely takes place in the context of a marriage. Couldn't be further from the truth. All you got to do is read it in context. Right after he says adultery, which in its technical sense is in a marriage, Jesus goes on to clarify, and everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with them in his heart. You know who this is for? You know who this revolutionary ethic, God's revolutionary standard applies to? Married, single, male, female. There is a different set where Jesus looks into every culture and he says, you are called to live above it. You're not called to sit there in self-righteousness looking down on other people. That's why so many folks right now they mock Christianity because most often and tragically, it's people in positions like mine or others. Folks come and they profess Christ and then we drag his name through the mud with our actions generally sexually. Not always. He's coming and he's saying, what's wrong? Jesus shows that sin it's not just the action, the physical act of stepping outside of the bounds of marriage, which hear me say, that's, that's wrong. Some of you are here and you are from homes where parents did that. Some of you are here and you are working to write marriages where a spouse has done that. Some of you are here and there is an enslavement, male and female, to images where you are stepping outside of what God has given you and you're stealing. It will kill you. We'll talk about that. Lustful intent. What does he mean here? We really got to understand that. Lustful intent. This is giving way to a sexual craving, desire. The word that helps me think through this, it's indulging. Like even the story I told you about the gal jogging, right? There's a sense of, okay, look Look away, fight for faithfulness. That was winning in righteousness. Sexual desire is a natural thing. Male and female, you will notice and appreciate beauty. The person who comes in their marriage, and we like all make the joke about how, well, there's no one that's attractive besides my wife or my husband. That's not true. God literally created male and female. 
He created the divine institution of sex, and he said it was good. One of the things the church can do, we have a terrible rap for this, is we just make sex, intimacy, in and of itself, like, demonic. No. The impact of sexual sin outside of the confines of marriage and the way he intended, it has brought absolutely demonic impact on my life and the lives of others. That's hands down true. But it's beautiful the way he intended it. It's wonderful. And we must see it in that way. So you got to know, temptation, it's not inherently lust. Lust, it can look like a lot of different things. There's obviously the physical objectification. There's the moment where you don't just look away, but you stare, you fantasize, you wonder. Not just about the naked physical appearance, but the lust of, say, for example, you come and you lust and you long for wondering what it would be like to be married to him, to be married to her. And a deviance creeps in with a strange sense of coveting for someone that is not yours. This can happen with a two-dimensional image. This can happen with the entertainment choices. This can happen with the movies we see, the shows we watch, the books you read. The books you read and no one knows you read them. The search history that you clear and no one knows you clear it. It's all of that. Denny Manor, and why does it matter so much? Jesus says this is an issue in his heart, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We saw this last week with anger. What is Jesus always after for me? He's always after my heart. He wants me. He wants all of me, my imperfection, my baggage, my brokenness, but he knows if he can change my heart, if my heart can yield to him, I'll grow, I'll change. There's freedom. He goes after the root. This is not just external action. It is internal change. That's why the moments, and, and tragically, God's given me freedom like I literally, and we'll talk about it in a bit, that I did not think was possible. But it's the same reason why you can come and you can linger in fantasy about someone else's husband. You can linger in fantasy on a computer or a phone or, or hey, everyone, but parents with the allowance of social media, you can linger by going to the search tab on any form of social media and in 10 seconds, you're in a bad place easily. He's after all of that. Why? Because every time your heart does that and my heart does that, we are drifting from him. It doesn't mean if you're a follower of his that you lose a relationship. But God will not bless what he opposes. My lust, he opposes. Yours, he opposes. I can remember I'd just gotten married, and I was a part of a newly married, we'd call it a community group here at the Springs, we call them foundation groups. It's where there's a leader couple with an established marriage over you. I had the best leader couple to lead it. I can remember one day I was in it, um, the leader's name was Kyle, his wife, her name was Lucina. Both of them amazing. I can remember Lucina, his wife, we were talking about sexual intimacy, lust. And I can remember one day, she just goes on a righteous soapbox. And she comes up and she says, you, and she was talking to our whole group, right? Kind of felt like, hey, you kids, but she didn't say it like that. She was more respectful. But she just said, you keep saying the word sex. Stop saying sex. Start calling it intimacy. Sex is a term that culture has deviated, perverted, and twisted. It makes it transactional. It makes it purely physical. This is an intimate moment. It, it damages intimacy with God if you deny it. It damages intimacy with a spouse. Even if you're single, even if you're a student, if you're not even thinking about marriage, you stealing lustful moments in whatever way, it is hindering the fellowship with God. It is taking from the intimacy with others. 
Now, as you'll see, I'll use those terms interchangeably, but her heart, amen. 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 See, Christians, we are called to join the sexual revolution, but sometimes we take God's revolutionary standard and we go the wrong way. What I mean by that is we make deviant what God makes beautiful. We talked about this briefly, where we can come and make sex, intimacy, a bad thing. See, here's, here's what could make sense to me. Non-Christian marriages, right? Non-Christian marriage is coming and where one spouse talks about intimacy or relations with another and says, oh yeah, he just wanted it and he kept asking. So I just gave way. Right? Or, or another spouse comes and there's just this sense of like begging or sex is weaponized or it's used in a certain sense. That's wrong. This is meant to build intimacy between you and And another, it is meant to flourish a faithfulness before God. Do do you know, this is one of my favorite verses, by the way, Proverbs 5, verses 18 through 19. All of you should memorize this. Speaking in the context of intimacy with a spouse, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived by the power of the Holy Spirit, he wrote this. Let your fountain be blessed. Now, how does he describe the fountain? And rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. This is meant to be the pursuit of Christian marriage and the intimacy therein. What Solomon doesn't recognize is sometimes you got to put kids down and you're tired, and Hollywood sells you a lie about what sex is. But church, do you see how as we fight for this standard, we we take this the wrong way. We have this zealous sense to just be opposed to any form of sexual immorality. And hear me say we should, but we don't come with zeal cling to the beauty of how you and I in covenant marriage, male and female, you are intended for pleasure. A picture of marriage is the gospel, the oneness between you and God. Do you know how oneness is personified? Yet we don't have a righteous high view of the beauty of intimacy. I'm okay if a non-believing, non-Bible trusting world degrades intimacy to some purely physical thing, makes it transactional. It's a lie. But we must view it in a revolutionary sense. I think that's understanding it in the way God intended. Do you know that intimacy, it's literally meant to bond you to your partner. I could read from Song of Solomon chapter 7. You can go back. I don't have enough time. I I could read from that. But you know there's literally a bonding element. And, And right now, what I'm fighting to do is bring a redemptive view of intimacy into your life single, into your life married couple. You know the way God made you, he designed you, he wired you? That when there's the moments of sexual intimacy, of expression, of relations, your body releases a number of neurochemicals. Females in particular, you will release estrogen. It will increase a sense of delight. Norepinephrine, this is a chemical, it's like adrenaline. It's what's going to allow you to feel a sense of the beating heart to focus and to push out other things, to be present. Dopamine, this is literally a sense of pleasure and happiness. Who made you to feel that? The creator of the heavens and the earth, vasopressin. This one is nicknamed by scientists the monogamy drug. Do you know why? I wish I had more time to talk about all of this. You literally attach to the images you are around, especially at a moment of climax. Vasopressin is a drug that literally bonds you. One of the things in marriages that I always ask couples, or I try to always get couples to say, is, hey, I covenant to make you the standard of my beauty. 
that's oppressed and is designed by God in a righteous place in the confines of marriage literally helps your partner, your spouse, your husband, your wife to become your standard. You attach to that. It's part of the reason why the reverse of that, why sexual sin can be so damaging. It's why you can have a hard time remembering past instances of anger, of greed, of self-righteousness, of whatever it might be. But those images, you can recall them. I can recall them. Finally, the one that God sets it up, oxytocin, a love hormone. Some scientists call it a cuddle hormone. Jesus Christ has a revolutionary standard. It absolutely goes countercultural to the ethic of today where we laugh at the things he died for. Last night, as I was getting ready for this, I was watching the show and I was laughing at the things he died for. I realized it. We need to respond to a revolutionary standard, but oftentimes the way we do that is we just make the thing itself, intimacy, a bad thing, a negative. We don't disciple our kids in what right intimacy with a spouse would be like to where they do it, not only to honor God, but also to preserve intimacy with another to where there's a real sense, and you saw this in the garden if you know your Bible, where they looked at each other and they were both naked and they were unashamed. That's what he wants for you. We cheapen it. I cheapen it. Join a divine, a righteous, a freeing, a liberating sexual revolution. Let's look at the second part that Jesus breaks down in a sense of strategy. Sense of strategy. He says in verse 29, he's about to get all forms of self-mutilation. Just kidding. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. What did Jesus do in our first point? He set a revolutionary standard. What is he doing in the second point? He's setting a revolutionary strategy. God's revolutionary strategy. Because here's what he just told everyone in that audience and you and me. right? Last week, if you remember, he redefined murder as anger. And he answered the question, who is a murderer? You. Me. This week, he's redefining adultery. And he's asking the question, who is is an adulterer. You. Me. And then he, in a way that always he does, he does not leave us in the dysfunction. He bids us to come out and he sets a revolutionary strategy for moving forward. We are to ruthlessly attack what relentlessly attacks us. Jesus, he sets it up to say that our approach to combating lustful intent, dwelling in that, indulging, is to be both sacrificial and radical. He says the right eye, the right hand. Scholars talk about how first century Jews, this was basically a way to say the best of your abilities, your vision and your skill. It was the best of what you had to offer for others. I imagine that's true because what Jesus is saying, the best of what you have to offer If it is going to lead you into sin, you need to be so severe. You need to take it so seriously. Run. Cut it off. Kill it. This is why folks sometimes, they'll say like, man, like Christians, you guys just all about like sexual repression. They usually mean two things. One, there's truth. The American church needs to redeem a biblical intention of sex and intimacy in, inside the confines of marriage. They really do. But the second thing, I usually end up talking with folks and saying, hey, I honestly, I don't think you're using the right word. They'll look at me like, oh, yeah, this is where he's going to back it off, and we'll talk about how we all need to be more like Jesus. I say, no, I don't think repression's strong enough. I think it's far more than repress. I think it's cut it off. I think it's kill it. I think it's crucify it. 
you got to go to a whole level deeper. Why would we do that? Why would we live in such a revolutionary way? Jesus is building to that. It's because we know a revolutionary love. And if the creator of the heavens and of the universe, the one who sees you and sees me in all of my dysfunction, all of my brokenness, and he says, I forgive you, I love you, come home. If he gives me that promise, I'm going to fight the drift of a sense of my flesh. If he gives you that promise single, this is why singles do crazy things. Like they get married and they kiss for the first time at the altar. It's ridiculous. And it's divinely beautiful. I didn't kiss my wife for the first time at the altar. I wish I did. There's never once been an instance in my life or in yours where sexual sin, I look back on it and I'm like, man, I'm glad I did that. Worth it has never happened. That's why Jesus is saying, no, 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 this is not repression. You kill it. You put it down. Anybody read the book, Old Yeller? Yeah, tragic. Old Yeller gets sick. What do you do? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that, that illustration was not in my notes. Not in, Stick to the notes, John. Stick to the notes. All right. Why is he so serious? He says right here, causes you to sin. Your translation might say stumble. Literally the word picture there, it's literally saying the word picture, it'd be like of a bait stick. So trappers, especially in this time, they would set traps for animals. And that, that trap would be loaded and there would be a bait stick that's set there. And a meat or whatever it would be to trap the animal would set on top of that. As soon as that is released, the bait switch or the bait stick is switched, which allows the trap to come down. He's pointing out how you cut it off, because if you don't, it will enslave you, it will keep you there, it'll kill you. I mean that both literally, spiritually, emotionally, I mean it in all the ways. This is not to be trifled with. Part of the reason he had to die was for the severity of my sin in all of its forms. He goes on at the end, and he says, you got to cut it off, you got to tear it out, you take these severe stances because it'll kill you. He says, and if you don't, your body will be thrown into the hell of fire. If you want to break down what that means, that's literally a reference to a physical location outside of the city of Jerusalem. But it's also a figurative reference to the reality of hell. Here's what I'm telling you, church. The stakes are massive. This matters. It is a revolutionary ethic, and Jesus is pleading with you and me to change. He sets a revolutionary standard, and he gives a revolutionary strategy. Th this strategy, it's so intense to where you come and you talk with followers of Christ, and, and they're grown men, grown women, and they have flip phones. Why? They lost the privilege of having internet on their phone. This one's so radical, so crazy, that young people that recognize, I'm not ready to get married, they don't date. Why? Because as soon as you start dating, man, I'm telling you, I don't care if you go sit and you watch a movie and you're just sitting there watching it, all of a sudden you have the desire. I don't care if you're middle school or you are 40 years old, 50, 60, you want to go from sitting like this to laying like that. Cut it off tear it out. You got to uphold the beauty. He is a revolutionary worth following. But it is revolutionary. Why does he do it this way? Why is it so serious? We can answer that a lot of ways. The first way I want to remind you, and I've alluded to it repeatedly, sexual sin will kill you. It will kill you. I do mean it, as I said, literally, physically, as well as spiritually, emotionally, mentally. Some of you, and I got nothing but grace and love, tragically been there, bought the t-shirt, bought a condo, had a timeshare. Sin will keep you there, and it will pummel you to death. Sexual sin, all sin, but especially has an ability to do that. 1 Peter 2, verse 11, Peter urges, he says, Beloved, I urge you, he's pleading, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain 
from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your souls. We could go and we could read multiple Proverbs where it literally talks about how the one who commits adultery, this is Proverbs 6, right? The one who commits adultery, and remember, Jesus just redefined that as lust, says he or she destroys themselves. We all, to varying degrees, know the weight of that sense of destruction. It has demolished marriages, torn apart families, kept single couples in a greater sense of confusion and wondering and not being able to think clearly to where it brought even more pain to a relationship. It creeps into the heart of middle schoolers and of high schoolers and of anyone and says, everyone does it. You can't tell anyone, especially your parents, especially your youth group leader. No, why? Because the second reason, sexual sin has a terrifying ability to bring about a sense of shame. If you're like me, and biblically, you are, here's what all sin does. Sin has a crippling ability to when you feel it, you can sit in a sense of guilt and shame. This is true. If, if this sin is heterosexual, if it is homosexual, it doesn't matter. You will sit in a crippling sense of shame, and then you'll feel like, I'll never get out. I'll never be able to change. Those are the tools of Satan. God comes, and he has divine power to demolish strongholds. We wage war with his weapons. Shame is not his tool conviction of the Holy Spirit that produces godly grief that leads to repentance. Oh, that's him all day long. But the shame where some of you, you have sat in a sense of I'll never be free kills. Sometimes we think that this doesn't have a cost. Well, I'm not hurting anyone. I'm not hurting me. Here's what I would tell you. Every time you offend God, Every time you act out sexually, you hurt you. There's no such thing as that without consequence. The third thing I'd tell you is you do hurt them. Let's say it's a 2D image. You further an industry that right now brings in more money than the National Basketball Association, Major League Baseball, National Hockey League, and uh, football. Porn. You further that, you objectify men and women, dehumanizing. You hurt them if it's in person. It's through text messaging. It's through they're in your room. It's through the hotel you rent, the, the college formal you go away on. You don't escape without consequence. So many of the people here This is a little bit of a separate note. This topic is so challenging because people used this and they hurt you in a very non-consensual way. You were abused, you were assaulted, it was violent, and it was wrong. There is a ruthless call, not in you, but of repentance for that. Here at the Springs, you will be found, beautiful, loved, cared for. We tolerate it. He died for it. We are called to freedom. It looks like being a part of a totally different sexual revolution. It's one in my life where I follow God's standard, not mine. It looks like you and me being honest about it. Where we don't just define it as I gave way and I looked or I acted, but it starts in the heart. You you kill the part of the heart. Some of you, the way that needs to show up, and right now I'm speaking to married Christians. You need need to take serious a theology of intimacy in your marriage. 
Some of you, you really got to up your game and you don't trifle with this. It's a gift from God. You need to recognize that. We as a church, we have to redemptively teach the beauty of intimacy. How he intended. Not that just sexual sin just brings shame, but there is beauty and expression and intimacy and bonding in a sense to where, where when you end that and there's a gift of connection between you and a spouse that in some way we don't know, we don't understand, and I, I wouldn't overthink it, but it shows the sense of oneness with a God in heaven that will never leave you nor forsake you. Stop settling. What if we did that? Some of you, married, single, everyone. You got to start actually killing this. You got to start actually taking it seriously. One of the things that shame makes people not want to do is confess. It means to acknowledge. If there's unrepentant, unconfessed sexual sin in your life, confess it. You can come tell me. I have no stone I can throw at you. There's no condemnation I can give. The only grace I found is at a cross, because if you did it, I did it. And he so loves me. Like he's proud of me. He's forgiven me. He uses me, and he sets me up to even care for other people on a topic that I literally once felt I will never be free He's so kind. You gotta tell somebody so he can remind you. You gotta tell somebody so you can honor him. Married, single. But if you're here and you don't believe in Jesus, here's what I'd plead for belief. Your sin of every kind, it is offensive. Let's say you don't think there's any hope for change. Just come, trust, receive grace at a cross. There's hope for me. There's hope for you. It's so easy to do what everybody else does. Jesus before, you remember even in Matthew 5, he talked about this city on a hill. He talked about in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God church to close. The final thing Jesus is showing here is he's showing how you and I, we can't meet the standard. He was preaching it to them and he's reminding you and me, your hope is Christ. Your long-term strategy for waging a war against sin is yes, taking it more severely, killing it, but it is growing a daily, deep, affectionate, abiding relationship with him. It's coming and not just walking away from the cold, but standing by the fire. You cannot do it alone. Join the revolution. I need your help, and by God's grace, I will help you. Freedom's worth it. He's already given it. Let me pray. Father, I thank you just for your word. How uh, I have a long way to go, but there is a different freedom and newness and integrity, and I pray you'd give it to everyone. Lord, would people come to see the fact that they, they are Mary Magdalene, they are the one brought before the king of adultery, accused and wrong for it, and that you could come and you could look at others and you could say, hey, which one of you is without sin? You could condemn her. They could condemn me, but there was no one And the only one who could condemn was you. And yet you were kind enough to not condemn but to die for me and to die for us. No greater love. Lord, we ask for your help to live in response to that love. We want to join the revolution. May shame not hold us back. May fear not hold us back. May insecurity not hold us back. May we find freedom and freedom in you. And may we run towards you, not just sit passively in shame, but repent. Knowing without you there is no hope, but that you love to help. So there is always hope. We love you. We thank you.